common topic that comes up a lot, even in our current CPOE system, our EPIC system, every time you try and prescribe a patient, any cephalosporin or carbapenem, there's always a warning that comes up if they have a penicillin allergy. So that kind of prompted me to want to do this topic. So why does this matter? Um, penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems make up 30% of all the current antibiotics. And that's counting all of the antibiotics, not even counting the fact that they probably make up 50 or 60% of all the commonly used antibiotics. And then for a lot of our infections that we're treating, including things like meningitis, pneumonias, things like that, cephalosporins and carbapenems are often the treatment of choice, first line treatment. And if you're withholding those because you're worried about uh, hypersensitivity, then that might not be the best for the patient. And then also just having to use all these different antibiotics, such as like Astrionam or some of the other ones that we have to go to when we're not allowed to use these other ones, that can just promote more resistance and more superbug infections. So how did this all start? Uh, pharmaceutical companies, I hope there's no pharmacists in the room who are going to get offended by this, but pharmaceutical companies were actually uh, one of the main entities to blame. Um, back in 1980, we only had a few cephalosporins available to us. These were cefazolin, cephalexin, and cephalothin. And then at this point, the cross-reactivity was estimated to be 5 to 10 percent. And there were some estimates just from random like case reports and studies and just like kind of word of mouth that were estimated as high as 40 percent. And what the pharmaceutical companies were doing is they were putting these percentages on their little paper that they have um, inside of all the antibiotic. And so this was getting just propagated over and over and over again. So the facts around penicillin allergies in general. 10% of the population is going to report a penicillin allergy. Not necessarily anaphylaxis, but it can be anything, rash, um, itching, things like that. And so before 1960, the way antibiotics were made in the lab was very, very impure. A lot of the cephalosporins they were making, were, they were actually using the same fungi that they were using to make penicillin. So they were all kind of having traces of different antibiotics in each one. And so there were all these theories. Is it the beta-lactam ring that's causing the allergy? Is it the side chains? They didn't quite know which was the culprit. And then there's also certain patients who just happen to be allergic to multiple antibiotics. And these patients were confounding the variables because you can't, they thought it was a cross-reaction when it was actually an individual allergy to multiple antibiotics. So here's the example of the beta-lactam ring, just as a quick view back to like OCHEM. Um, as you can see, the penicillin and the cephalosporin both have this beta-lactam ring. And here's the side chains. So these are the similar side chains. The two main culprits, if you notice, for cephalexin and penicillin, they have almost an identical side chain with the NH2. Um, and then if you look at down below at amoxicillin and cefazolin, they also have really similar side chain. Now, if you compare this to looking at third and fourth generation cephalosporins to penicillin and amoxicillin, there's no similarities between their side chains, completely different. So we'll go back to that in a minute when we talk about some of the studies. But here's just some of the history behind it. Uh, the first cephalosporin we had was called cephalothin in 1968. <clears throat> and it was marketed to be used in penicillin allergic patients. The problem was is in the lab where they were making the cephalothin, they were using the same fungi as they were making the penicillins with. So there were a lot of traces of penicillin contaminating the cephalothin. So there were all these allergies being reported by patients who were also allergic to penicillins. And this got propagated um, because of that. And so the package insert was changed for cephalothin to reflect that there was a 10% cross reactivity. And that has been continued and continued with multiple cephalosporins now. It's just been continued to be propagated. Here's an example of a label, and this is a current label of, um, that's actually on ceftriaxone. And this is a current label from 2017, or sorry, 2016. They didn't have a 2017 one on Google. But as you can see towards the bottom, I should have highlighted this, but towards the bottom it says serious acute hypersensitivity <laughs> reactions may occur if you use this to a patient who has demonstrated allergy to penicillin. So that is still the current uh, warning that the pharmaceutical companies are putting out there. So now let's go to the research. There's been a couple more recent articles that I will talk about. There was one in 2012 in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, 
And this talked about the use of cephalosporins in penicillin allergic patients. And this was a huge literature review. They actually reviewed the literature all the way from 1960 until 2005. And there was hundreds and hundreds of articles that they were looking at and case reports. And throughout their entire review, they averaged out that the one, it was a 1% 1 risk of cross-reactivity. They did find that there was one article that reported a 27% risk for cefadroxyl. But cefadroxyl is a first-generation cephalosporin that has similar side chain to amoxicillin. So that could explain that. Here's some more examples of articles. There was an article in 1995 in the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and they concluded there was no risk of cross-reaction for the third and fourth generation cephalosporins. There was another article in the Investigational Allergy and Clinical Immunology Journal in 2015 that showed the skin test and the oral challenges showed no cross-reaction to second generation, third generation, or fourth generation. But the important thing to note was the second generation cephalosporins they were looking at were all the ones that had different side chains. At UC Davis in 1994, Dr. Kishiyama published a study that showed in vitro study actually showed cross-reaction. So I got my hands on this article and I looked to see what they were testing because it was just an in vitro study. They weren't actually using uh, oral trials or anything like that. And it turns out they were doing a skin test that was just um, showing some, like that the patient was reacting to the beta-lactam ring. And they weren't actually having a reaction to the cephalosporin. They were just picking up some antibodies that were to the beta-lactam ring that was the same in the cephalosporins and the penicillins. And then the medical letter of 2012 showed there was a 0.1% risk of reaction to first and second generations, but they did not include identical side chain cephalosporins. Dr. Romano uh, presented an article just recently in 2016 in Current Allergy and Asthma Report. Um, and this was a huge meta-analysis from 1966 to 2005. And they showed that there was a significant increase to first generation cephalosporins, including cephalothin um, and cephalexin. And these are both ones that had similar side chains. But there was no increase to the second generation or third generation for the ones that didn't have similar side chains. Cephalosporin facts. There is no documented cases actually in the literature or in any study that show that there's been cross-reaction in patients to third or fourth generation. However, if you look at a Rocephin label, it still shows that there's an increased risk of severe allergic reaction in these penicillin allergic patients. Same for the ceftaroline package. It reports clear cross-reactivity risk, even though there's never been a documented case ever in the literature. So what is the truth about cephalosporins? Maybe the incidence is 1% to 3% for people just having baseline cephalosporin allergy for non-penicillin allergic patients. That's just an individual allergy to cephalosporins on its own. The incidence of anaphylaxis is very low in these, less than 0.002%. And I think the bottom line should be if people are allergic to amoxicillin, you should avoid first and second generation cephalosporins that have the similar side chains such as cephalexin, um, because we don't actually know what the incidence is. And some studies reported at 10%, some have reported it at 27%. So that should be the only ones that should be avoided. Now let's talk about carbapenems before we go to the overall conclusions. There have been some studies, because if you, if you click on ordering meropenem or imipenem in the CPO, I mean, sorry, in Epic, the same warning pops up as it does for the cephalosporins. And I just ordered one the other day, and this warning definitely pops up. I should have taken a screenshot of it. But in 2006, Romano looked at 112 patients, and they did skin tests first. And out of, out of the, all these patients, only one patient had a reaction to the skin test. Then he tested all of these patients with a trial dose. And all of them, including the person who had the reaction to the skin test, tolerated the 500 milligram dose without any reaction. He also did another study in 2007 with a, a separate population of 104 patients. And again, only one patient had the reaction to meropenem skin test, and all the patients, again, also tolerated the trial dose. Here's a couple more recent studies um, that showed pretty similar outcomes. One of them was clinical infectious diseases in 2015. Patients who had a confirmed skin allergy test for penicillin, because they didn't want to just take all the patients that just report having a rash, so they confirmed that they were actually allergic to penicillin, and then they gave them carbapenems. They started with a skin test as well in this study and then went to trial dose. And all of them were fine except for a 1% reaction. 
they had a rash. Dr. Romano um, published another article in 2016 in Current Allergy and Asthma Report, and he tested 211 patients who had a confirmed positive skin test to penicillin, and none of them reacted to getting a trial dose of imipenem. So what is the truth about carbapenems? The cross-reactivity to the skin test was 1%. But if the patients tolerated the skin test, there have been no reports of any allergic reactions when they've been given full doses. So the bottom line for this is, if you can do a skin test, great. Do it just to be safe, especially in the anaphylactic patients. But if you can't do a skin test, start with the trial dose and see what happens. Research key findings, we kind of already went through all of this, but the moral of the story, just look from looking at all the research, the overall cross-reactivity seems to be around 1% for both cephalosporins and carbapenems, and it might not even be that high. Overall cross-reactivity rate with patients who definitely had confirmed skin tests to penicillin was 2.5% overall in the literature if you average out all the different reports. Cross-reactivity between penicillin and all third and fourth generations is negligible. There was pretty much no reports of this. And then if a patient has an allergy to amoxicillin or ampicillin, you should avoid first and second generation cephalosporins with the similar side chains, because that was more seen in case reports and in the literature. I really like this slide. This is actually in one of the current USMLE study books, and I feel like it's pretty accurate. So they're basically giving you a little cheat sheet and saying, if the patient has anaphylactic reaction to penicillin, and you're trying to figure out if you want to give them a first-generation cephalosporin, it's kind of plus or minus. This is The plus would be if, it's, um, if you're going to give them something that doesn't have a similar side chain, you probably can without any problems. You want to avoid things like cefazolin, cephalexin. Um, <clears throat> if they have a similar side chain, same type of thing for the first and second generation, it's better just to avoid those medications. There's plenty of other cephalosporins you can give. And then for all the other groups, it's perfectly fine to use cephalosporins. So the bottom line, you should be able to feel comfortable giving any of your patients any of the third or fourth generation cephalosporins and carbapenems, even if they have documented pen penicillin allergy. It would be safer to avoid the cephalosporins with identical side chains, as I was saying. And then if a patient does have a reaction, it's more likely that they just have allergy, individual allergy to both penicillin and cephalosporin, not a cross-reaction. Thank you.